Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, for everybody on, uh, my name is Dr. Chris Montanero, and tonight's topic of discussion is going to be balancing female hormones naturally. So we'll just jump in. Uh, a quick, just ahead before we get started, this is going to be a little bit different than some of the other ones that we've done so far in that Getting into female hormones, we're going to be covering a little bit more on the science side, the biology and physiology of what's taking place. Uh, I really want women to be able to know and understand all their different hormones and what the hormones are actually doing, some of the differences between what's actually in the body and the way that it works versus some of the synthetic uh, hormones or hormones from other animals that are being put in the body. So it's really important to understand those. So that ultimately, when you're faced with decisions, whether it's, it's more of a uh, allopathic Western medicine approach or a, a more holistic approach, you at least have all of the information necessary to make the best choices for yourself. And that's really the name of the game is try to get as much information from all of your healthcare professionals and then make the best decision that, that you can for yourself. So we'll go ahead and we can get started here. So just to start out a little bit, we'll be covering some things about nutrition, but half of what we eat feeds our bodies and helps us to grow. The other half feeds the healthcare industry and doctors. And we'll get into a little bit about what that means. Do you know of any other industry other than the healthcare industry that says with a straight face and gets away with it, the quality of the materials that go into building our products are irrelevant? And the quality of the materials that are used to maintain the operation of our products are also irrelevant. If we consider the human body as the product of the healthcare industry, this is certainly the idea that is being conveyed to all of us. All of the structures and functions that are in the human body are built from and run on nutrients, every single one. And those nutrients are obtained from what we eat. In every moment of every day, Cells, tissues, organs, and thousands and thousands of biochemical messengers like enzymes, neurotransmitters, and hormones are being broken down and rebuilt. And something to keep in mind with that, every single cell in our entire body is brand new every single seven-year cycle. Um, every cell is, is a little bit different depending on the area of the body. Every blood cell is going to be brand new every about 120 days. So there's a little bit different as far as... Uh, times that are going to be associated with how quickly our cells are going to regenerate and create new ones. But we have our choice to either rebuild a completely 100% new body every seven years, uh, and certainly along the way, versus uh, building a body on ho-hos and cupcakes and ding-dongs and, and, and building a body that's becoming weaker and sicker as the months and years go on. So... Yet, the conventional healthcare industry does not consider it worth talking about the quality of the materials used in this perpetual recycling of the human body. Any old thing will do, and we're led to believe, as long as it's within the broad outline of the infamous food pyramid, that we're doing good. When you process a food for eternal shelf life, you take all the nutrients out, which is the living part of the food, and you spray back a few poisons and then say it has nothing to do with healthcare. And uh, certainly, as we'll see, that's just not true. So a lot of times patients come to the office and they're trying to figure out what they should be eating and what they shouldn't be. And a lot of times they'll just start taking a look as far as what the body is actually made of. And it can give us a really good idea as, as where we should be looking. So body composition is largely water. And I would argue that's actually the number one deficiency people have these days is, is getting enough water. Uh, the solid portions being about three quarters protein, about a quarter fat, and containing several pounds of minerals and really a, a quite tiny amount of carbohydrates. So doing the math, that's a really good idea of what our plates should look like when we're eating. But we go to the junkyard and we eat all those lousy foods that are devitalized, chemical imitation, fractions of nutrients, indigestible mineral supplements for rebuilding what we hope to be, really strong, enduring, stress-handling, effective, healthy bodies. And that's just not going to happen. The materials with which we build and rebuild our body are considered so unimportant that most conventional healthcare practitioners are giving little, if any, training on that subject. And that, that's part of where the problem is. A lot of times, if they're lucky, they would even have an elective course in that. And this is really the building blocks that build our health from the ground up, and, and it's just not being taught. 
So, driving that point home a little bit further, what if the airline industry has decided to take the same approach as the healthcare industry? They end up building aircraft from scrap metal and various other parts from the junkyard. They're serviced whenever the industry gets around to it with similar junkyard materials. And when the jets constantly malfunction and crash, the airline industry runs elaborate and costly diagnostic tests and procedures and discovers all kinds of things that aren't working right. And when the warning lights light up the cockpit, duct tape is put over them to technically cure the disorder. You can't see it anymore. That warning light's not there, and that happens a lot of times when people are experiencing pain or any type of symptoms. You can take any number of drugs that can block pain signals going up to the brain so that you don't feel it anymore, but it doesn't mean that it's actually healed and fixed at that point either. So nevertheless, Neither are the, uh, ever the qualities of the properties of the materials used to build and maintain the planes ever evaluated. If anyone in the industry brings up the subject of evaluating the building materials, they're called quacks and told that such alternative approaches are unproven. And when the jets crash and burn and kill people, and of course they will, the airline industry still refuses to talk about the materials used to build their aircraft because they learn from the healthcare industry that it just doesn't matter. No other industry in existence would ever be able to get away with such blatant nonsense, deception, and downright lack of common sense, except for the healthcare industry. So, like we had, I had talked a little bit before, normal functioning cycle usually is translated into having some discomfort and, and symptoms. Actually, your normal cycle is meant to have no discomfort and symptoms. A lot of times... Women think that they're supposed to have the, the normal headaches or the normal mood swings or the normal bleeding or clots, uh, and that's just not something that's true. It's just that it's so common and it happens so much that it's thought to be completely normal and nobody questions that anymore. And even something like menopause is something that's meant to be an easy transition for women. But with all of these things being so usual, they're just they're not normal. We're going to get a lot more into depth with that as the rest of the webinar here goes on. But we're going to talk a minute for about trading common sense for high-tech situations. So if we were to take a look at surgeries in this country, the number one surgery is a C-section. National C-section rate is about 25%, and in teaching hospitals, it's 60%. Now, if you go to Scandinavian hospitals, they only 3 to 6% of them will be doing C-sections. And this next line, I know the number is different. It's actually significantly worse. Last I looked, it was actually closer to um, 48 or 49, but I didn't have an exact statistic right in front of me that I could quote to somebody right away if I needed to. Um, so the last number that I had when I uh, had put this webinar together originally, the U.S. infant mortality rate is ranked between 22nd or 23rd in the world, yes, yet the U.S. spends more per birth than any other country in the entire world. You know, and we think of ourselves as the most technologically advanced, most powerful country in the world, and the babies in our country die, and we're 23rd in the world? That just is, is mind-blowing. And when we take something that's just so natural, that's happened for thousands of years, and then we start trying to throw technology into the mix and just you know, a lot of times for legal purposes start cutting women open and doing these C-sections. You know, it certainly has a lot of implications as far as our, our mortality rates in the country as well. Number two surgery in this country is hysterectomy, which is essentially female castration. And there are so many alternatives to instead to of jumping in and having surgery but because medical doctors have to follow strict guidelines neither they or you know about the often more effective alternative approaches the pill doesn't regulate your cycle it actually suppresses your hormones like putting duct tape on the warning light and there's a lot of different instances that we're going to get into and explain uh, as well so what we want you to do is understand your body so that you don't have to be afraid of it. And then when you go to your doctor and they start throwing around a lot of terminology or that you only have this one option and there's nothing else around, that that's just not the case. And you So that you can understand that and just make better, more informed decisions. So it's just not a one-sided decision. So now we're going to start jumping a little bit into the hormones. But GNRH, gonadotropic releasing hormone, 
is something that comes from the hypothalamus, and it stimulates the pituitary. Now, the pituitary gland is, for all intents and purposes for our discussion tonight, is the master gland. It kind of controls everything that happens in the body from a hormone uh, point of view. And they produce two different things. The, the pituitary produces FSH and LH. FSH is known as follicle-stimulating hormone, which is produced at the, in the pituitary again. And it stimulates the follicle to mature and prepare to release the egg. And the other hormone that's very important here is called LH, which is luteinizing hormone from the pituitary, which surges around the mid-cycle and causes ovulation to occur, which basically means that it stimulates the follicle to rupture and then to release the egg. And then a lot of women have at least heard that term estrogen. They know that they've got estrogen in the body, and that's largely what allows women to develop their, their secondary sex characteristics. Um, and several things that it does, though, we've got our ov it's a ovarian hormone largely, and it's secreted by uh, the developing follicle uh, quite often as well. There's uh, three main types of estrogens. There's E1, E2, and E3. You don't really need to specifically memorize the names for each one, but it's estrone is E1, estradiol is E2, and estriol is E3. Estrogen causes a cell proliferation and the buildup of the uterine lining to prepare for implantation. And this is really important as we're going to be seeing, but basically what it is happening is it causes that uterine lining to grow thicker and to, to be able to allow for implantation so that the baby can be able to uh, grow throughout pregnancy. And if there's no fertilization that takes place, that's why there's bleeding every month because the, that uterine lining is sloughing off. Um, and this is basically the predominant ovarian hormone in the first half of the menstrual cycle. And what's going to happen is, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment, we'll get into another one, uh, it's called progesterone. Ovari it's an ovarian hormone as well, secreted by the corpus luteum if ovulation occurs. And it basically, it helps take that uterine lining and it, it ripens it. And now you, where estrogen starts the growing of it, almost like uh, you, you, you're planting grass and it starts to grow, then you, you're going to add the progesterone and it allows to really ripen and grow in really nice and strong and, and, and develop uh, into a mature lining and really allow for that implantation. It's going to cause other developing follicles to dissolve so that you don't have multiple implantations taking place. Uh, it's the predominant hormone in the second half of the cycle. So in the first half of the month, you've got estrogen that's going to be a lot higher. second half of the month is going to be progesterone. And you need sufficient amounts to be able to sustain pregnancy. And this is largely a lot of times a problem when women start having their, having miscarriages um, because they can't sustain that pregnancy because of a, a, a decrease in the amount of progesterone. And progesterone really is one of those reasons why women sometimes when they're pregnant they have what's known as that pregnant glow because the, uh, progesterone is that, that happy, really feel-good type of hormone that women get and it's supposed to be higher uh, throughout pregnancy. So a lot of times women will feel that. Um, progesterone along with estrogen, uh, estriol are the predominant hormones of pregnancy. The placenta joins in the production of these hormones at about the third month of pregnancy. And if anything goes wrong during the cycle, basically it's called a cyst. And they will naturally dissolve during your next cycle. It's nothing to be overly concerned with. Uh, it's a normal thing and are always uh, being formed. So, But it can be painful, uh, although it's not necessarily dangerous. So if we can see here... Uh, my pointer, I'm actually in the, the, the middle box here, if, if you can't see, and uh, looking at estrogen. So what's going to be happening here for most women is you start that first half of uh, the cycle, and it starts surging up. Estrogen starts increasing so that uterine lining is able to, to grow and proliferate so that we can allow for implantation. Now, and then if you don't have that implantation, it's going to drop off uh, again as well. But what's happening these days is because there are over 100,000 chemicals in everyday life that act like estrogen in the body, that instead of starting the period off at these very, very low levels at the beginning every month, they're actually starting up much, much higher 
and they're coming across, and then they're getting a surge way, way higher than they normally should. And this is where we're seeing you know, girls that are developing their secondary sex characteristics when they're eight and nine years old, when they're starting to have their periods and developing breasts. Um, they're starting to have much, much, much heavier bleeds because the uterine lining is growing way thicker than it's supposed to, and then that leads to throwing a lot more clots and a lot more cysts. Um, and then it just the natural progression is all of those clots and cysts and too much growth that's not coming off um, leads into endometriosis and then leads into cancerous problems. Um, so uh, we're going to be focusing a lot on how women have what's kind of considered this estrogen dominance. Uh, where, where estrogen is just kind of running rampant and is way too high uh, as far as the xeno hormones, these estrogens that aren't natural to the body that we're getting in from things like uh, a lot of dairy products have um, estrogens that are pumped into the cows that allow them to produce a whole lot more milk and then we ultimately get that in our bodies as well. That's just one simple example. So again, to get into our estrogens, E1 makes up about 5 to 10 percent of our estrogen, women's estrogen. Uh, it's considered a very strong estrogen because of its ability to cause cell proliferation, uh, which means cell growth. We've got estradiol, which is that E2, which makes up again about 5 to 10 percent, and it's considered the strongest of all the estrogens because of its ability to cause cell proliferation. And then women have estriol, E3. Uh, which is about 80 to 90 percent of all of the estrogen, and it's considered one of the weaker estrogens, uh, and it does not have a very strong cell proliferation. However, estriol appears to be um, to balance the cell proliferation effects of estrone and estradiol, uh, conferring its protection against their cancer-causing abilities. Uh, if you take the E1 and E2, and they're running rampant, they're causing a lot of cell proliferation. So you got the growth of all these cells, and if that's not going to be regulated, and you're getting growth of cells and more growth and more growth in an unregulated way, basically that's what cancer is, is just a, a lot of growth that's uncontrolled. So that E3 will help keep it in balance, and that's what women tend to have more of. So here's some different things. I won't read every single one line for line, but some of the, several of the things that estrogen does in a woman's body. It certainly, as most people know, confers uh, female secondary sex characteristics, uh, promotes cell proliferation and growth of the uterine lining, which we've already uh, talked about. It will slow bone loss and stimulate brain, brain function, uh, plays a role in cognition, memory, emotions, mood, stamina, ambition, uh, pain perception, and sleep. It uh, increases body fat, especially in the hips, abdomen, and thighs, and this is one of those issues where when we've got way, way too much estrogen and we've got these estrogen dominant uh, traits taking place because we're getting estrogens from so many areas, it actually can make that dep deposition of fat that much worse and it gets to be a, a significant issue for a lot of people. Uh, it creates progesterone receptors. Uh, estrogen em uh, emergence during puberty slows the growth of the long bones in both males and females. Um, promotes hydration increases HDLs, which is considered the good type of cholesterol, and it lowers the LDLs, which is a lot of times referred to as the bad cholesterol, um, and it does several other things. So causes of estrogen dominance. This is where we've got so much more estrogen in everyday life and in our bodies than we ever have throughout human history, and it's caused by an increase in stress xenohormone exposure, oral or inject, injected contraceptives, hormone replacement therapy, adrenal fatigue, hypothyroidism, certainly poor diets, consumption of trans fats, nutritional deficiencies, um, luteal insufficiency, uh, so you're not getting enough of the progesterone, and this is largely one of the problems. You could actually, because what, was, what ultimately happens is progesterone is somewhat going to balance estrogen in the body. That's part of its job to do that. And what's also going to happen is you could technically have low estrogen levels and if you don't have enough progesterone that even is at lower levels, it will still create estrogen dominant type symptoms in the body. So you could technically have a very low amount of estrogen, but if it's unopposed and you don't have any progesterone, 
it can still create what's called estrogen dominance type symptoms. So that, that, that you can actually have both situations going on at the same time. And there's ways of knowing that and testing for it that we can, we're can we going to be talking about. But um, And one of the best ways to actually test for it is through saliva testing. And I actually, even just this past weekend, um, at a seminar that I was at, there was uh, a particular uh, laboratory that was being represented there who was uh, speaking. And finally, we're, New York State was the only state in the whole country that we really couldn't do saliva testing. And they uh, spent 13 months and went through an incredible amount of uh, hoops to jump through. And we can do saliva testing now through them. Uh, for all of these hormones, and it's the absolute best way of being able to measure those things. So um, you can see exactly what's happening, whether the estrogen's at normal levels or if estrogen's low and progesterone's even lower, creating estrogen dominance problems or uh, any number of different uh, combinations that can be there along with several other hormones as well. So now excellent testing that, that can be used. So xenohormones, they alter the number of receptors on cell membranes. They alter the sensitivity of cell receptors on the membranes. They inhibit the release of hormones. They stimulate the release of hormones. They disrupt the balance and interaction between hormones. They just really mess everything up, up and down in every last direction that you could think of. They also increase cancers. They'll decrease fertility. They'll increase uh, PMS-type symptoms and create all of that estrogen dominance that we were talking about. And because it's written on the screen, this is kind of a... Well, a good time for me to kind of explain a little bit of a story um, considering uh, fertility issues. There's a, a great book that was written. It's called Pottinger's Cats, and it was written by a doctor who did all of these different uh, studies on cats. He had hundreds and hundreds of them. And originally, he was continuing his uh, own father's research on tuberculosis, and this was going back into the 1930s. But he ended up uh, doing a lot of different research with cats. And what he ended up finding was he had basically two major groups of cats. One of them was fed more of the whole foods. Um, they had you know, fish oil and, and, and raw products that weren't cooked and processed. And the other group, they fed basically refined and processed foods. And what he found was... The refined and processed group, even in that first generation, they became very slow and lethargic um, and, and becoming sick. And then when they got to the next generation up, the, the cats who were eating the raw foods, they were doing really well. And the, the cats who were eating the refined and processed foods, basically they, they discovered and documented the first case of asthma in a cat ever. They were very osteoporotic. Um, they had a lot more diseases. They were a lot slower. Their reaction times were very slow. You should be able to, and they showed on a, a particular video where you could toss the cats. Normally they should land right on their feet and it's not an issue. Um, but their sense of coordination was very off with these uh, process and refined group. So they'd kind of land on their sides. Um, and you get the third generation and their bones were paper thin. Their whole um, skull structure was very significantly changed. A lot of their sinuses didn't even fill in and be covered by bone. Um, the fontanelles, which are those areas of the skull that fill in, and look at the soft areas on a baby's head, um, they're just massively uh, opened up and never fused. Um, but another thing that happened when they got to the third generation was that they had no sexual interest whatsoever. And if they could get them to mate, which was a really difficult situation, but if they got them to mate, they never could get past third generation because every single one was a stillbirth. And if you take that same analogy and apply it to humans, technically, you know, the age group for myself, if you've got the age group somewhere between 25 and 35, we're technically considered about third generation since we've been largely processing and refining so much of our food. And you know, these days the problems that women are having with fertility issues and miscarriages are just absolutely off the charts and it's never been that bad of a problem. And uh, if we compare it to some of those studies that were done in the past, it certainly makes sense. And we've got things like cancers and osteoporosis and all of these things that are significantly increasing 
And I would argue that these are just nutritional deficiencies that are being passed on from generation to generation. Uh, a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, diabetes runs in my family, it's genetic, or heart disease runs in my family, it's genetic. You know, it, most of the time I would argue that it's actually just that grandma ate that way, so mom ate that way, and now I'm eating that way, and there's nutritional deficiencies being passed along the way, and everybody ends up with the same type of diseases in the body. A true marker would be if you could actually go back 100 generations in your family and see how much heart disease and diabetes was there then because that would truly be a genetic problem. And uh, I would argue that in most cases, if you go back uh, anywhere close to that far, that you just won't see the, the amounts of cancers and heart disease and diabetes and any of those types of things. Um, so something to kind of keep in mind when people argue that uh, it's just it's genetic and they, they can't control it. So... Let, it, let us continue. Uh, hormones are measured in nanograms, which is parts per billion, and picograms, which is parts per trillion. So nanograms is basically like putting a pinch of salt into 10 tons of potato chips. So an incredibly tiny amount into 10 ton, tons of potato chips. Picograms being parts per trillion, this is like putting one drop of water in a six-mile-long train with 660 tank cars. So it just gives you an idea of even the tiniest, tiniest amounts of hormones in the body has absolutely huge and major effects. So hundreds of hormones and hormone-like biochemicals act throughout the body. And when we've got you know, hormones coming in from our food supply and then you know, certainly with contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy and we're throwing all these hormones at the body that are supposed to be already in a very, very tiny amount, you're kind of playing with fire a lot of times. Uh, let's see here. Hormones basically, for all intents and purposes, control everything in the body from metabolism to development and reproduction, mental and emotional and behavioral processes, growth, repair, maintenance, and fetal development. And over the past 60 years, 87,000 man-made chemicals, and it's actually upwards of 100,000 now, have been introduced into the food and water supply and the environment. And dozens of these chemicals are routinely found in human tissues, blood, the bloodstream, and even breast milk. There's even, in one of the last lectures that I gave over the past few weeks, there's been measured over 200 known cancer-causing chemicals that are crossing the placenta into babies now. Uh, that, that are being measured, and it's just a, a huge problem that humans have never had to deal with over uh, any period of time except for the last 100 years or so. So sources of these xenohormones certainly are pesticides, non-organic crops, uh, home lawns and gardens, schoolyards, public parks, side, uh, sides and centers of roadways, golf courses, insects, and, and bug control under the foundations of homes. Um, they cause disruption of hormones, genetic damage, destroyed digestive enzymes. They're carcinogenic. They cause infertility and certainly a lot of stuff that we don't even know about yet. And humans are exposed to pesticides through the fat tissue of commercially grown livestock from residues on all commercially grown food and through environmental contact. And these pesticides especially accumulate inside the home. So... Xenohormones also come from plastics, so a lot of times uh, all of the water bottles that uh, we're using these days are very soft plastics, so especially being careful not leaving them in, in really hot cars and drinking the water that you, you can even taste the plastic in the water at that point. Um, that it certainly can be a dangerous situation. Um, plastics, when they're heated in a microwave uh, or the bottle left out in the car, like I had said, can, can leach a lot of those uh, hormones out. Plastics basically leach hormone disruptors and are used in packaging, toys, teething rings, baby formula bottles, water bottles, uh, blood bags, IV bags, car parts, inks, uh, nail polish, cling wraps, and just goes on and on. We've got plastics just about everywhere and we get those uh, hormone disruptors uh, through a lot of plastics. And when they are burned, some of them release something known as dioxins, which are potent hormone disruptors. Dioxins are also found in anything that's bleached, anything from our clothes to foods to even tampons. And you know, we've got all these dioxins in the bleached cotton that are used in, these, in, in the tampons, and they're, 
they're, they're inserted in an area where the, the lining, the vaginal lining is very thin and it can absorb things very, very readily. Um, so you're certainly getting a lot of these uh, uh, lousy situations, xenohormones and dioxins in through um, those, those bleached cottons um, or anything of that nature with plastics or, or, or bleached um, things. Xenohormones is coming from plasticizers or phthalates, which uh, make plastics more flexible. Uh, they're breathed in from that new car smell. A lot of times people like that smell, but you're, you're, we're certainly breathing in a lot of hormones, uh, hormone-like substances. Um, they're also found in cosmetics, synthetic leathers, adhesives, caulking, insecticides, repellents, uh, perfumes. Um, Bisphenol A is another component of plastics, and it's used to coat metal products like a tin can, bottle tops, and water supply pipes, dental sealants, dental composites, and these all leach from food, beverages, and dental materials directly into our mouths. Xenohormones come from our pharmaceuticals like birth control pills, injected contraceptives, conventional hormone replacement therapy, fertility drugs, and synthetic estrogens given to non-organically raised livestock to fatten them up so that we can, they, our farmers can make more money or be able you know, from the livestock themselves or from the, the milk being produced. We've got other classes of xenohormones that are called uh, persistent organic pollutants. Or we've also got PCBs, um, polychlorinated by, by phenols. Uh, they're a class of basically 209 different chemicals and a class of oily compounds that do not burn very easily. And they're used in electrical insulation, lubricants, adhesives, plastics, weather and fire resistant coating for wood and plastic and even cosmetics. And this is just to give you an idea. I mean, you're hearing where all of this stuff is from, and it's kind of to the point where you just, even if you're trying to be as perfect as possible, these days we just can't get away from a lot of these things. And all these things were banned, these PCBs, they were banned by the United States in 1976, and they're uh, produced in Russia through most of the 1990s. They can also be found in virtually all areas of the ecosystem. You can go up to the penguins in the Antarctic and you can still measure these PCBs. That's how widespread they are. It, it's absolutely incredible. And it's well documented cause of multitudes of health problems, especially multiple types of hormone disruption. So again, back to the dioxins and furans that we had talked about with the, the bleaching of, of uh, plastic products and of cotton. There are a family of over 200 chemicals produced by uh, a product of chemical processing involving chlorine, such as bleeping, uh, bleaching uh, food, pulp, paper, and cotton, uh, production of some of our pesticides, manufacturing PVC, vinyl plastics, metal smelting, waste incineration, combustion gasoline, dry cleaning, and dioxins are actually fat-soluble on their long-lasting chemicals, which allows them to accumulate and concentrate in our food chain. And dioxins is one of the most part, potent carcinogens that's ever been tested on the face of the earth. And it has been linked to causes of problems with the thyroid, reproductive systems, immune system, fetal development, and liver problems as well. Xenohormones can also be found in our detergents, a class of 100 chemicals and their derivatives including alkylphenol ethoxylates, uh, also known as APES, and nanophenol ethoxylates as well are surfactants from petroleum. They are basically in our cleaning products that dissolve oil and grease, our spermicides, nail lacquers, cosmetics, hair products, soaps, shaving foams, stabilizers, and some of our plastics. All of our detergents basically break up that greasy, grimy stuff. And they're very slow to break down and therefore have built up in the environment, which creates a lot of our issues that we have. Um, so, and we've also been uh, seeing the MPAS uh, hormones. They've been shown in the lab to leach uh, plastic flasks and cause breast cancer cells out of control. And then we've also got issues with indoor pollution. And the public doesn't understand that the house is a hazardous waste site. All of the things that, in your, that are in your house are made of the same chemicals that are on the hazardous list. And Americans spend only about 5% of their time outdoors. So indoor sources of pollution are a major contributor to human exposure. And tracking things in from what 
you know, we brought from the outdoors in. It just accumulates and accumulates on top of all of the other 8,000 things we've already mentioned that contain a lot of these xenohormones uh, in our households. So things like house dust, carrier of multiple pollutants, uh, they enter through doors, windows, and garage carrying contaminants. Uh, they're tracked in on shoes, carrying high levels of pesticide residues. Uh, although lead is no longer put in gasoline, it has saturated the land near houses and roads. Uh, it is quite common to find lead in the middle of the yard at 100 parts per million and in the house 1,000 parts per million. Uh, there is no UV sunlight in most houses, so the UV light basically breaks down most pollutants, and so a lot of people don't have that in their homes. Uh, there's no ozone or ions generated in most homes, so and nature uses ozone naturally and ions to clean the air, um, which is why a lot of, uh, in my house we've got uh, a few ozone, ion, and UV uh, machines running so that it can uh, destroy and, and kill a lot of that nasty stuff that we bring into the house. Uh, better and better sealing and insulation of houses has created an environment in which pollutants are held in and they're built up and concentrated over time. Um, certainly with ca uh, carpet use, they're easier to concentrate. Um, a lot of the toxic materials from cleaning products to uh, deodorants and cosmetics, um, they, they just accumulate more and more. So and, and can be worse with certain professions. You know, certainly painters and automotive mechanics and dry cleaners and people who are around chemicals all day long certainly are going to create those concentrations that much more often. And then we've got issues where car garages are attached uh, to houses and basements or other possible contributors to household pollution. Uh, don't cool down or warm up uh, cars in the garage because those will certainly leach all those chemicals leaching into the home. And uh, don't do projects which involve glues, solvents, paints, and other chemicals in the basement or garage because they all infiltrate the house as well. And if you store gasoline in the garage, the benzene, which continually evaporates, leak through, leaks through the house as well, through doors and through seals. Um, and basically these days, virtually all tap water is chlorinated. And there's reason for it because you know, there would be a lot of other health issues if it wasn't. But when running the shower, dishwater, and washing machine, large amounts of chloroform are created and spread throughout the house. And if you don't remember from any t particular TV shows where somebody would use a bottle of chloroform and put it on a rag to be able to knock somebody out, uh, that's what that is. And when we've got the chlorine that goes into that gaseous state, uh, anything as simple as even being in a really hot shower and all that steam, if you've got chlorinated water that's coming through there, then you're breathing in chloroform. So certainly things like whole house filtration units, or on a less expensive end, you can certainly put the, uh, the chlorine filtration uh, units right on the shower heads themselves uh, to try to block out some of that. So estrogen excess. These are just a few of the things that can be caused by uh, this estrogen excess. Uh, too much of all of these hormones that we've been talking about, where we get all of them from. So that gives you an idea that now, uh, just how high some of these numbers are because we're around these things all day long. They cause heavy bleeds, which leads to all sorts of problems where you know, women are having uh, a lot more painful uh, menses and, and uh, PMS type symptoms. A lot more clotting and cramping, water retention and bloating, breast tenderness, lumpiness, cystic breast, and large breast, fibrocytic breast, weight gain, headaches and migraines, emotional hypersensitivity, Depression, irritability, anxiety, anger, and agitation, decreased sexual response, decreased libido, um, thyroid dysfunction, cold hands and feet, blood sugar instability, your sweet cravings all the time, insomnia, gallbladder dysfunction, and really the list just goes on and on and on. Just I mean, It's linked to so many different things because these hormones, especially estrogen, have such a profound impact on the body and certainly linked to multiple different types of cancers and infertility as well. So supplementation with estrogens, uh, there are bioidentical triestrogens and biestrogens, and they're available through healthcare professionals, and they're made from plant sterols, which are compounded into hormones that are exact replicas of human estrogen, or progesterone, testosterone, or any steroid hormone. And at this point, it seems that the most desirable way to supplement estrogen is sublingually. You know, when, you know, that's best case scenario. A lot of these creams, for example, They've been shown to build up in the subcutaneous fat, 
uh, and they just start uh, basically accumulating little bits at a time over time and, and get having larger amounts in the body ultimately. Uh, so and that would be the transdermally uh, where, where it's being put on the skin. Orally, you're automatically going to have to be given a pill that's a higher dosage of that particular hormone because the liver is going to break a lot of that down. So uh, a lot of times sublingual is going to be an excellent situation. Um, you know, they're, they're all things that can help, but really paying attention to being bioidentical as opposed to uh, when people say that you know, it's made in a chemistry lab and it's synthetic, but it's the same thing. It's it's not the same thing. It, it's not exactly what you know, your body is making. So being particularly uh, paying close attention to you know, using something that is bioidentical is very important. As I had said earlier today, people are dying of thirst. It's the number one deficiency of today. Clean water for drinking, bathing, and growing food is one of the most precious commodities on the planet. And you constantly read in the paper about how we are running out of oil and energy and how these resources can only last another 20 or 30 years. But the simple fact is that it's 20 to 30 years longer than we have for water. Already in many parts of the world, lack of clean water is the biggest problem facing huge numbers of people. And some people say that in the next 50 years there will actually be more wars fought over good clean water than there will be over oil. Um, and it's certainly the most important thing that we can put in our body. And typical average, uh, if you can consider, say, the 200-pound individual, the, the best recommendation is roughly about half your body weight in ounces. So and for a 200-pound individual, 100 ounces of water a day is, is, is really what we need to be getting. And if you're... Yeah, somebody who sweats a lot or you're working out a lot, then it's certainly you want to replace those fluids as well, so be that much higher. In advanced societies, thinking that tea, coffee, alcohol, soda pop, or other forms of manufactured beverages are desirable substitutes, that's just not the case. We need good, clean water. And it basically regulates every single function in our body. And if you wanted to improve your health, just by drinking lots of water will do a significant increase in your overall level of health. In China, it is currently running a water deficit equivalent to seven times the water usage of the entire state of California. And there are a lot of people in California. In the next few years, that deficit will triple. And already, the Yellow River, one of the most important rivers in China, is so low in water that it's failed to reach the ocean on 226 days back in 1997. Certainly, that's worse with the exact statistics today. Uh, and it's a big, big issue. And keep in mind that the maximum contamin contamination limits that water districts so proudly adhere to merely represent a compromised standard designed to be economically feasible for water districts to meet. They in no way come close to the safety standards established by the U.S. government's Safe Water Drinking Act. On average, drinking water in the United States currently contains over 2,100 toxic chemicals that are known to cause cancer, cell mutation, and nervous disorders. And this is not particularly surprising considering that there are close to 100,000 chemicals now in everyday use with over 1,000 new ones being added each year. In fact, according to the EPA, our Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. industries generate some 79 million pounds of toxic waste each year that is not disposed of properly. And what is probably more surprising is the fact that according to the EPA, 53 million Americans unknowingly drink tap water that is polluted with feces, radiation, or other contaminants. Also, according to our EPA, some 45 million people drink water polluted with the parasite cryptosporidium that killed more than 100 people in Milwaukee in 1993, or that over half of all Americans drink water that has been used at least once before. Each year, at least 400,000 cases of illness can be directly attributed to contaminated water. And as much work as states are doing to improve this, it's still advised not to drink straight tap water, well water, or bottled water, because even though you don't notice or see the effects immediately, this is one of those things that just slowly build up over time and become more and more problematic. Um, certainly, we understand that chlorine needs to be put into our water supply because it ultimately kills some of the worst of the worst stuff that's there. Um, which means that filtering that out and a lot of the other stuff that gets through the filtration processes is something that we need to do at our homes. Um, there's whole house units uh, that certainly can be used, and that's going to be a lot 
more expensive type of an option for people, but it's certainly an option. Um, there's a particular unit that I use in the in the home as well. You know, usually for really really good one, you're not looking at the twenty or thirty dollar um, filter. Usually you're looking more along the lines of three hundred fifty four hundred dollar unit, but you'll you'll ultimately uh, ha have a big increase overall for the level of health and the the safety of the water that you're drinking. Chlorine in the water is basically it's a, a disinfectant used to purify our drinking water. It needs to be you know certainly made clear again that I'm not advocating eliminating it from the purification process. It controls many diseases including typhoid fever, cholera, dysentery, and several others. So one thing that we need to know is that chlorine is also one of the most toxic, toxic substances that we know of. Uh, it does everything from drying your skin and destroying your hair to wiping out the beneficial bacteria in your colon, which makes up about 60% of your immune system. The products of chlorination, we talked about chloroform, dichloroacetic acid, and MX, which are found in drinking water, are all proven carcinogens. And according to the U.S. Council on Environmental Quality, the cancer risk among people drinking chlorinated water is 93% higher than among those whose water does not contain chlorine. That should be bolded and highlighted in 14 different colors. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really important thing to, to consider. And then when we add in all the other hormones and stuff we're getting into our body from all the other areas, if we can eliminate that or cut it down as much as possible, it really has a massive improvement on our overall level of health. Uh, there is a higher incidence of cancer of the esophagus, rectum, breast, and larynx, and a higher incidence of Hodgkin's disease among those drinking chlorinated water. Chlorine has been strongly implicated as a major factor of the onset of atherosclerosis and its resulting heart attacks and strokes. By the same mechanism that chlorine narrows blood vessels that feed the heart, it also narrows the blood vessels that feed the brain. So consequently, chlorine has been implicated in major cause of onset of senility. Basically, chlorine, like I said, needs to remain in the, the city water purification process at this point in time. But again, removing it at the house can be really important and help with overall level of health, but especially hormone-related issues. And we had discussed this as well, uh, certainly being able to filter both at the shower and uh, for what we're drinking in our drinking water is going to be really important. Now we're going to talk a little bit about progesterone. Progesterone, like we had said before, balances estrogen. It where estrogen is going to cause cell proliferation and growth, progesterone stops cell division and signaling the process of what we want to do is actually mature. So instead of lots and lots and lots of baby cells, it takes those baby cells and brings them to adulthood and makes them more mature. It prevents estrogen from over overproducing uh, the uterine lining and having way too much buildup. So if we've got enough progesterone uh, for women, you likely aren't going to have as much of a problem with excessive bleeding and clots and cysts and, and, a, and a lot of the other uh, PMS-type symptoms during menses. Um, maintains and protects the fetus, uh, stimulates new bone growth, helps calm and focus the brain. It helps burn fat for energy. It's a natural antidepressant. It can increase libido. It's a natural muscle relaxant. And we go down this list, every single one of these sounds absolutely amazing. So most women are like, okay, where do I get some? Um, and really, ultimately, when it comes down to it, hormones are very powerful and are not to be taken too lightly. Uh, measuring where everything is at so that we know and can follow all those things is very important. Um, so the saliva testing is one of the best things that's, that's happened in a long time uh, to, to be able to follow them more closely. Um, but certainly being able to use bioidentical progesterone uh, can help with so many different things, as you can see here, um, including progesterone is just naturally anti-inflammatory in nature. So a lot of just general pain, achiness, and inflammation in the body can be balanced out by progesterone. It's just one of those hormones that make f females and everybody, and males uh, have some too. It just it makes you feel really good. Um, very important. Progesterone deficiencies will cause basically everything like a estrogen dominant type situation. You're going to get the PMS, the heavy bleeding, clotting, inability to concentrate, short term memory loss, uh, water retention, insomnia, breast tenderness, weight gain, thyroid dysfunction, hot flashes, headaches, anxiety, osteoporosis, and on and on and on, endometriosis, um, all sorts of problems. So 
uh, making sure that uh, women especially have uh, progesterone levels that are well within normal is, is very important for overall level of health. So supplementation with progesterone. There are basically two different sides of this you really need to understand. There is the natural progesterone that is bioidentical to what's supposed to be in your body. And then there is what are known as progestins. Medical research quite often interchanges both of those names and doesn't make any distinction in them whatsoever. But be aware that the one under the second one called progestins is the synthetic one. And that's the stuff ultimately that I would argue you don't want to be putting into the body. What you ultimately want is the stuff that is bioidentical progesterone in your body. And it's caused a lot of confusion. The progestins have numerous dangerous side effects, while progesterone has almost no side effects, uh, except when given an overdose. Many of the negative side effects of progestins, which is the synthetic form, our depression and weight gain and all of those estrogen dominant type symptoms that we've been talking about. Progesterone naturally keeps all of those estrogen dominant things in check so that those aren't an issue and it makes you feel great and creates a lot of healthy things in the body. Progestins actually do the exact opposite of what progesterone is supposed to be doing in your body. Uh, so they can be very dangerous and progestins, the synthetic form, is what's in a lot of hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills and things of that nature. So which hormones are tested? Hormone testing, when we're doing uh, research studies, basically, largely what's being used are horse hormones and synthetic hormones. And the reasons for that is we can actually patent those things and drug companies can make a lot of money. Bioidentical, when it's just completely 100% natural and it's the way that it normally is, you can't patent that because it's something that's completely 100% natural. And you, if you can't patent it, then you can't make enough money on it. Hence, you're not going to do research on it as well. Uh, it won't be funded and that's just not what's going to be available. So bioidentical hormones. These hormones are made from plants and are 100% identical to human hormones. Because they are 100% natural, like I said, they can't be patented. And no money can made, be made from those. And nobody knows how these safe hormones, nutrition and herbs, can work more effectively than uh, many of the drugs out there. And a lot of people just don't realize that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that there's so many different nutrients and herbs and, and holistic things that we could do for the body that are just as strong or stronger than any medications out there without the negative side effects. And they're just promoting health to get bigger and stronger. Um, as opposed to things that are you know, a lot, so many drugs that have to be broken down in the liver and, and create liver damage and damage so many other things throughout the body. There's, there's a huge problem. And they're not even hiding that fact anymore. I was watching a commercial the other day, uh, the new Advair commercial, which is a drug for asthma. They're promoting and saying that they, you know, their drug um, will help with both different causes of asthma and how good it is, and then the very next sentence is, may cause a significant increase in asthma-related death, which I just, I, I shook my head. I had to call four or five family members at that point in time and ask them if, if I was going out of my mind or if I misheard what was being said, and I actually recorded it. Um, it just blew my mind that some, a drug that's supposed to help asthma actually can increase the risk of dying from asthma. And they're they're not even hiding those facts anymore. If you listen to the drug ads, all you know, and it's not simple side effects. There's things like death and stroke, and the list goes on and on and on. And you know, most people, when they really think about it, they almost rather deal with whatever one symptom it was versus all of the different side effects that they could be getting uh, if they could at all, at all avoid it. And you know, those drugs and surgery are always available. You know, certainly potentially trying something that's more natural, improving your health so much that your body just takes care of the issue is a great place to start. And if it doesn't help you or make significant enough changes because we haven't, you haven't done it long enough or not the right combination, but those drugs and surgery are always still available. So it's certainly something to consider and, and trying to understand all pieces of the puzzle like hopefully we're doing here tonight so that you can just end up making the best educated decisions for yourselves. 
So problems with conventional hormone replacement. Uh, one, it's very well known called Premarin. Um, basically, it, it, it's, it's its name from pregnant mare's urine. That's where we get Premarin, which basically is the urine from pregnant horses. And that urine, the estrogens there, is what's given to women as hormone replacement therapy. And whether people in the audience know it or not, the hormones in horses happen to be significantly different than hormones in human beings. So what we're doing with hormone replacement, you know, even the best endocrinologists in the world don't truly understand the depths of our endocrine systems and hormones in our body. And humans think that they're so smart, it's much smarter than the body, that we're actually going to take different hormones from a completely different animal like a horse and put them into a female. And... Uh, I'm not sure that that's the uh, the best logic. Uh, this horse estrogen is the most commonly prescribed estrogen in the world. It is the form of estrogen most commonly used in research, including taxpayer-funded research. And this means that most of what we think we know about estrogen replacement in women is actually about horse estrogen replacement in humans. The problems with Premarin, it's basically for horses and not for humans. Heavy menstrual bleeding can be caused by it, and cramping, breast tenderness, fluid retention, headaches, migraine, depression, anxiety, basically the same list that we've covered a bunch of times, embolism, stroke, uh, loss of scalp hair, growth of facial hair, gallbladder disease, pancreatitis, leg cramps, all sorts of different problems. Basically the exact opposite of, of what natural, real estrogen is supposed to be doing in the body. So just so that you can actually compare and see differences between human and horse estrogen. Human estrogens, we've got E1, E2, and E3. Uh, estriol, estrone is est, uh, E1. Est, estradiol is uh, E2. Um, and then with Premarin, we've got estrone, which is the E1, is 75 to 80%. There's a totally different hormone called equalin, which is 6 to 5%, and estradiol, and they actually have several others in hor uh, horse hormones that make up another 5 to 19 percent of all the hormones. So definitely significantly different and in much different ratios as well. Whereas in a, a horse, E1 is actually 80 percent, whereas the E1 in humans um, is going to be in that 10 to 20 percent range. So uh, it's a very, very, very strong estrogen hormone and uh, something to certainly keep in mind. Again, problems with Premarin continued. The metabolic breakdown products of Premarin are biologically stronger and more active than original equine estrogens. Various studies have shown that these breakdown products can produce DNA damage that is cancer-causing. So breast cancer increases as well. All hormone replacement therapy is prescribed using standard dosages and not tailored to individual requirements. And this usually means women are often taking much more estrogen than they need. And it takes about eight weeks to clear Premarin out of the body. And in contrast, natural hormones are completely metabolized and cleared in 6 to 12 hours. So it just, again, gives you an idea of what some of these things, how they can build up in the body as opposed to the real good natural stuff. Who'd have thought? Premarin can easily and usually does throw a woman into estrogen dominance. And again, we remember some of those slides, and they're all very similar, all the different types of symptoms that are associated with estrogen dominance. And it causes an excessive increase in sex hormone binding globulin, which in turn blocks thyroid hormone production. It forms of estrogen with similar side effects. We've got, you know, you go through the whole list, estroderm, chimera, fempage, menarest, alera, um, Orthest, Menest, Senestin, uh, Prempro, uh, there's just all sorts of different names that are just very similar synthetic estrogens, horse hormones putting, being put into the body. Progestins, now if we remember the progestins is a synthetic form. It's chemical or drug imitation of progesterone with disturbing side effects. Something like Provera is the most common progestin. It is also used in Prempro, which is Premarin and Provera combined into one. Sounds like a yummy little con concoction there. Most progestins are made by taking natural progesterone and altering the chemical structure so it can be patented. Why not just use the real thing? I'm not sure. Another type of progestin is made by altering a synthetic form of testosterone. 
Problems with progestins, it supplies production of natural progesterone in the body. I'm sorry, it suppresses production of natural progesterone in the body. It disrupts the steroid hormone pathways, which can cause both immediate and or insidious undermining of both adrenal and gonadal function. And your adrenals are what helps you deal with stress. And when you're not handling stress as well, you're producing lots of cortisol, which lowers your immune system and gonadal function. And that can do everything from messing with your hormones to uh, creating libido problems and just the whole uh, list of things that we've discussed already. And since the steroid hormone pathway is fundamental to energy and vitality, this drug is usually a prescription for chronic fatigue and probably fibromyalgia, not conventionally recognized. So side effects of progestins, where progesterone, if we remember that slide of all those absolutely amazing things that the real natural progesterone does, now we'll look at what synthetic progestins do. It increases depression, anxiety, fatigue, fluid retention, and weight gain, migraines, angina, cancers, insomnia, acne, strokes, breast cancer. Uh, in the 2002 Physician's Desk Reference, it states about progestins, the effects of prolonged use of this drug on pituitary, ovarian, adrenal, hepatic, or uterine function is unknown. Emphasis needs to be placed that natural progesterone has none of these side effects. And in fact, natural progesterone actually protects from any of these things from happening. And it's not uncommon for health professionals to not know that progestins and progesterone are not the same thing. You know, they're used so interchangeably in the literature that, that it's just not common knowledge. Even some of the, the, the better specialists that are out there who deal with hormones Sometimes they just don't truly understand the differences between the synthetic progestins versus the natural progesterone. So hopefully uh, even you learning some of this can help educate. So unopposed estrogen replacement. So if you're just giving estrogen and not balancing it with progesterone, we've already demonstrated how that can be certainly a big problem creating estrogen dominant symptoms. And that means estrogens are given without progestins or progesterone. And routinely this is given to women when the uterus has been removed. And conventionally, progestins are given to women who still have a uterus to protect them from endometrial cancer. The only known cause of endometrial cancer is unopposed estrogen. And unopposed estrogen is almost what's done all the time. So if it's the only known cause of cancer, endometrial cancer, I'm not sure that that math really adds up 100%. I think somebody needs to... Uh, relook and spend a little bit of time uh, in the thinking process with that. And progestins have so many side effects and risk factors that when the uterus has been removed, they're not given. The problems continued leads to estrogen dominance, which we've discussed already. And in this country, a woman's need for progesterone is ignored except in pregnancy. Either pre- or post-menopausally, a woman normally should have much more progesterone than estrogen. Estrogen won't function properly without progesterone. And the majority of hysterectomies are done because of heavy bleeding, fibroids, or out-of-controlled endometriosis, which, all of which is balanced by natural amounts of real good progesterone. And the uterus is removed quite often because uh, a lot of people don't know where to even think about trying. So some male doctor on high just said that women don't need their uteruses or their fallopian tubes or their ovaries or, you know, any of their female uh, hormone producing characteristics and just remove all of them because it just doesn't matter. And uh, only a, a male would be so foolish to do something like that, but it's done so routinely these days. And then to add it off and top it off, they're put on unopposed estrogen, just lots and lots of estrogen replacement and not giving any progesterone along with it because it's considered so unimportant. But I think we've discussed and understanding just how important progesterone is. Oral and injected contraceptives, they consist of low-dose mixtures of synthetic estrogens and synthetic progestins, or sometimes just synthetic progestins. These work by suppressing the endocrine system and preventing ovulation. The pill is often given to regulate the female cycle, and it does not regulate it. It suppresses it, and it can increase estrogen dominance. Risks, yeah, certainly you know, some of the big ones that are important to think about. Uh, birth control pills can significantly increase blood clots, stroke, heart attacks, 
uh, cancers, nutritional deficiencies, especially your B vitamins, which is involved with all of your you know, energy pathways in the body, uh, insulin resistance, headaches and migraines, and chronic fatigue problems, and just a whole slew of problems. Um, and that's part of the problem using synthetic hormones, uh, synthetic anything. So even the, uh, I have a major issue if you'll refer back to, it's on the website, the Seminar on Nutrition from the Masters, and we get into the differences between uh, whole food supplementation, nutrition that comes directly from food versus vitamins that are manufactured synthetically in a chemistry laboratory and then put into a, a, a tablet form. Uh, again, when we, we're, as humans, not as smart as we think we are. Uh, Mother Nature, God, whoever you'd like to put uh, that fits into your paradigm, it was much smarter than we'll ever be. We can't produce in a chemistry lab what Mother Nature or God has, has, has so incredibly done. Uh, it just can't happen. And we think when we think that we're or are hoping that we're as smart as we think we are, then that's when we start becoming very dangerous. And, and hopefully you can kind of get an idea of just how dangerous this, the, those situations can be. Um, I did because it's a little bit difficult to diagram. Uh, I'm not drawing a lot of things out here like I would normally when I'm in person doing this seminar. Uh, I did kind of water some things down quite a bit. Um, so certainly if anybody uh, listening in is interested in finding out more information, there are probably thousands of questions or needs for things being repeated. Um, also getting into uh, everybody because there's so many hormone issues and they're so individualistic for each person. A lot of it comes down to finding out, seeing the actual tests involved, and there's multiple that I can do in the office, and also sending out for salivary testing and, and other types of testing as well so that it can be very specific uh, uh, to, to what your particular needs are. And, and then it can be worked on from a completely 100% natural point of view. And, you know, if for whatever reason you weren't happy and it wasn't doing what we were hoping it to, then there's always the, the more invasive things that certainly come with their, their, their side effects and their risks, but we don't necessarily have to always start there. Um, so there's a bunch of different food sources of organic uh, foods that I'll have on here. Um, I'll have this seminar up uh, on the website in the next couple of days. The last two have already been put up there uh, in the member section, uh, and, and those can be watched. So a couple of quotes to kind of finish this up because I like to leave people with some things to think about uh, and that mental, emotional uh, side of things and to think about our health. Uh, one of my favorite movies, Patch Adams, at the very end, uh, the, this is the point in which Patch Adams was in front of the medical board uh, for practice medicine without a license because uh, he hadn't yet graduated and he was just helping people. I wasn't giving them drugs, but was just literally just in love with his patients and trying to help as many people as possible. And they asked, uh, you know, what if one of those patients had died? And his response was, what's wrong with death? What are we so mortally afraid of? Why can't we treat death with a certain amount of humanity and dignity and decency and, God forbid, maybe even humor? Death isn't the enemy. If we're going to fight a disease, let's fight one of the most terrible diseases of all, indifference. I sat in your schools and listened to people talk about transference and professional distance. Transference is inevitable. Every human being has impact on another. Why don't we want that in a doctor-patient relationship? That's why I've listened to your teachings and I believe they're wrong. A doctor's mission should not be just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why when you tr treat a disease, you win or you lose. But when you treat a person, I guarantee you, you win every time, no matter what the outcome. And certainly laughing, even about cancer and death. Uh, a lot of times if you look and try to follow any literature uh, as far as alternative cancer type treatments, you know, one of the things that they'll do is have you, you know, throw on I Love Lucy reruns or, or, or comedies so that you're laughing all the time. Uh, that positive uh, mental attitude, laughing, those deep feelings of love are some of the most powerful emotions that you can have for improving your level of health. Most patients need much more in their lives than medication. Health is interwoven with an individual's perception of the quality of their life. Dissatisfaction with working 
uh, with work and family have self-prevented a cure for improvement in health from ever happening. Patch Adams would spend hours learning about his or her patients' families, their lovers, friends, jobs, and hobbies, the entire person. He never defined people by their disease. Most individuals, he says, are unhappy about their lives and need a huge amount of psychological and spiritual nourishment. Suppose a person came in with cancer and they spent 100 hours together. How many hours would be spending talking about the physical aspects of the cancer? Two hours or maybe even 10. The rest of that time, they would talk about the human being and why it would matter whether that person lived or died. So what are you passionate about? What excites you? What turns you on? Now, th these emotions uh, are just so incredibly Im important and powerful as far as our overall level of health. Uh, the recent newsletter that I sent out this past week, uh, I discussed a, a book that I bought an entire case of and made it absolutely 100% mandatory reading for every one of my family members. So in an indirect way, that was kind of a nice way of saying I'm making it as mandatory as possible for my patients to read as well. Um, and it just is one of the most incredible one-stop sources of understanding how powerful our emotions, our thoughts, and our feelings play on our overall level of health and how powerful they are. Just to give it a quick example, one of the things they talked about was uh, that our thoughts, our emotions, and our feelings aren't something that doesn't exist physically. They, they actually physically exist. Their energy that can't be created or destroyed. It's true energy and it can be measured. So what they had done was use a very specific and sophisticated pieces of equipment that can measure energy, radio waves, frequency, and it measures zero in the middle and it can go to 500 in the positive or 500 in the negative. And what they had done was they took the, the world's most powerful radio uh, generator, broadcaster, that can generate radio frequency around the entire world and it measured at a 9 in the positive 9 out of 500. They also took that instrument and started bringing it into dying patients hospital rooms literally with hours maybe days to live and during the times when they were in prayer so those intense feelings of love and emotion and that one connectedness with their creator it was bouncing as hard as it could be off of 500 and it certainly uh, the indication that if that meter went much higher than 500 it would be so our most powerful broadcasting unit that we have to broadcast radio across the entire world only measured at a nine and we, when we've got thoughts and emotion and that 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 connection is just incredibly powerful and it's not something so that demonstrates it's not something that just doesn't physically exist so when we've got these negative thoughts and these negative emotions, it's that, all that negative energy that's truly living inside of each of every one of our cells is just uh, crushing our health in a lot of different ways. It's absolutely fascinating read, uh, and I certainly I, I bought a whole case so uh, so that people uh, and my patients can can read through that and uh, and improve their overall level of health and understand just how important that can be. And one more quote from Patch Adams, one of my favorites. Uh, in the American Journal of Medicine, it is found that laughter increases the secretion of catecholamines and endorphins, which in turn increases oxygenation of the blood, relaxes the artery, speeds up the heart, increases blood pressure, or decreases blood pressure, which has a positive effect on all cardiovascular and respiratory ailments, as well as increasing the overall immune system response. And one of my favorites as well is known as the rocking chair test. Picture yourself in your rocking chair at 90 or 100 years old, maybe 125, 150 years old, and you are talking to your grandchildren or great-grandchildren. And what things will you tell them? What would you have them, which, what would you want to have accomplished before you die? Would you want to uh, have wanted to learn, do, see, create, experience, love, or accomplish. Hopefully you won't have to look back and realize you spent your life wandering aimlessly, never having love, passion, or meeting your goals. Hopefully you don't have to wish you could do it all over because you wasted the time that you were given, uh, both by not having a clear focus on your passions in life and not having the level of health that allows you to pursue 
your 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 God given talents and your passions and and the, your true gifts that we have to to give to the world. Uh, and it's it's not much time that we have. And the more you get treated regularly, uh, certainly it, it will increase your level of of health overall. And uh, when you are in that rocking chair. You can say it was a great life. I accomplished so many amazing things and small things. And I experienced the world. I loved and used the talents I was blessed with. Be passionate about your life, your family, and your loved ones. And in the end, what matters most is your relationships with your family, your friends, and your loved ones. It's not about the things that you accumulate. And if you don't get anything else from this, take this home. You only have a limited time on earth. Focus on what matters most and be passionate every single day. Let your love and passion drive everything that you do, and you'll pass your own rocking chair test with no regrets. Create your life every single day. I want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, certainly uh, everybody on here has probably been on the website, but there it is again, wellnesscny.com. Phone number, certainly uh, if people are interested in consultations, asking more uh, information, uh, how I can help in any possible way, that's exactly what I'm here for and I uh, love to do that. That's what I'm passionate about. And uh, I'm going to end that here. I'm going to stop the recording.